<sighs> Hello. Yeah, I'm on my way into the office. Traffic is an absolute nightmare. I'm, I'm going to see you in, I reckon, a couple of hours. Sorry, it's just terrible out here. Okay, bye. <sighs> This week on Click, we're raiding the wardrobe and trying on the wearables that could kill downtime and make you a better worker. We'll stick on the Formula One sensors that are now helping us to win the race for a healthier life. And we have reviews and recommendations on the joy of gaming in Webscape. Welcome to Click, I'm Spencer Kelly and welcome to Greenwich Park in London. That is the Royal Observatory, home of Greenwich Mean Time. That is such an important place. See, there came a point in history where they were able to shrink the workings of a clock to a size which made time portable. And that completely changed the world, of course. And here we are on the verge of a similar revolution, where electronics are getting so small that we can wear those too. Lara Lewington has been investigating one of the many applications of this technology at the home of the McLaren Formula One team, where every second counts. F1 cars and improving our health aren't two things that obviously go hand in hand. Here at McLaren Surrey HQ, it looks like it's all about bright lights and fast cars. The team spend millions each year on analysing and crunching data on everything from tyre pressure to aerodynamic performance. Yet the technology used to log data on how well these vehicles are performing could provide a breakthrough in the way that we monitor ourselves. Here in McLaren's Applied Technology Labs, engineers have taken their ability to process and analyse data and created a sensor which logs a person's exertion during periods of activity. They do it in a different way to most wearables. Now most of the fitness tracking devices that we see these days are accelerometer based, but this is all about heart rate variability. Now these sensors aren't going to tell you that you've walked five kilometres, but they are going to come up with an idea of how much you've exerted yourself, and that could be translated into calories. So we have F1 accuracy recording human data all in wearable form. The question is, could this tech be used not in racing, but to help public health? Ian Waring is taking part in a unique trial, which Click has been following to find the answer. How can the use of wearables be integrated into the UK's National Health Service? Ian had been diagnosed as obese. Conditions related to being overweight cost the NHS around £5 billion a year to treat. He wore the sensors for 10 weeks and lost 26 pounds. Well, the sensor's been really good. You're given a target of calories to burn just doing specific exercise um, each day. And, and being able to monitor that by, by looking at the end of the, um, of the session, how many calories you've burnt, um, for me, has been really motivating because you're always trying to do more and more and more and more. So, Ian, this is a snapshot of a 24-hour period. At Ian's surgery in Suffolk, 90 patients are taking part in the research to see where the wearable monitoring is more effective than scheduled visits to the doctor. They can access the data themselves and also talk it through with their GP. If we could um, have a, a way of using activity as a drug, if we could prescribe activity more appropriately, if we could help provide biofeedback relating to activity, immediately we've got this tool that potentially, and I think our research will hopefully help answer some of these questions, potentially could be so powerful to prevent illness, but then help illness. And this is just the start. The aim is that this slightly chunky device can eventually be miniaturised and once they're produced in bulk, the cost should be massively reduced, therefore making them more accessible. Those in the NHS see wearables and their data as a huge potential tool for public health.
The financial implications for patients being able to self-monitor, to self-manage, to even have some more information about what their body's about will be amazing. It will go straight with your consent into your clinical records. It will form an integral part of your record. It will then help me to monitor you and will be providing much better, much more personalised healthcare. Of course, it doesn't mean the end of going to see your doctor, but used in the right way, it could mean that one day we could all get the Formula One treatment. Lara Lewington. Now, one of the most recognisable pieces of wearable tech at the moment is this thing here, Google Glass. It's still in the development stage, but last week it went on sale in the United States for just one day. The price, a cool $1,500. But aside from making you stand out from the crowd, why is everyone looking at me like that? The question I think we all want answered is will it actually be of any use? Will it indeed take off? Hey, morning, Mr. Spears. Good morning. In the last few weeks, those flying Virgin Atlantic's upper class from Heathrow have been greeted by someone with an eye for detail. And one back to check in? Just the one. Okay, follow me in, Mr. Spears. Thank you. Ken is one of the concierges trialling glass as a way of accessing relevant information without the need for handheld notes. That's great, Mr. Spears. Thank you. When a passenger is approaching the airport, the details get sent to Ken's glasses here, and then he can go out and greet them. And this is what Ken can see. On the first page, you can see the name of the passenger, the registration number of their car, and their destination. And then he can move on to details about that destination. For example, how they're going to be picked up, what time they're going to arrive, and also their frequent flyer number. Ken, I have to ask, how do the passengers react when they see you wearing them? Um, the initial thought is that they're regular glasses until they take a second look. After that, then they're more intrigued with what they are, what they can do, why, why am I wearing them, that sort of thing. And why is he wearing them? Well, there's no denying that any company seen to be testing something that looks this space age will win a few PR points. Although discreet, wearable devices, especially those capable of recording pictures and video like this one, do have the potential to lose you fans too. For example, developing an app for Glass that involves facial recognition is currently against Google's terms and conditions, and it's something Virgin won't consider for fear of invading its customers' privacy. So, under what circumstances might we be more comfortable with devices which allow others to identify us by sight? I, I think what's holding it back now is, I mean, glass is very restricted, so it's like really lopsided, so there's only a privileged few have it, right? So if you put that kind of functionality in there, there'll be a lashback of, you know, well, you can figure out who I am, but I can't, you know, because you're wearing glass. Um, but, you know, when it gets to the state that everyone's got glass and is, you know, is in the same way everyone's got a smartphone like that, it becomes some equivalent of it is, you know, commonly found out there, then, you know, we'll get more comfortable with it. One place you might expect to be fully on board the glass bandwagon would be San Francisco. Home to employees of companies like Google and Facebook, it's often seen as an early adopter when it comes to new tech. But even here, glass has been met with a decidedly mixed response. A self-confessed dive bar, the 500 Club in the city's Mission District, is taking a stand against what it sees as an invasion of technology into its area of peace and tranquility. Foremost, it's an issue of privacy. You know, our customers come here and expect a sort of sanctuary, you know, a, a place away for whatever they're dealing with, it's work or the family or just to be by themselves, watch sports, have a drink, and not be documented. The 500 isn't alone, and there's even a website listing bars and clubs in the San Francisco Bay Area that are glass-free zones. It's clear that Google still has a job to do in convincing people that glass isn't just a portable version of Big Brother. So what do you make of glass or the similar products that are knocking about? Too intrusive? Too distracting? or just the right level of cyber cool for you. We'd love to hear from you. Email click at bbc.co.uk or get hold of us on Twitter, Google and Facebook too. Next up, it's a look at this week's tech news. 
Facebook is introducing a not at all frightening new feature which allows users of the social network to track the location of their friends via GPS. Called Nearby Friends, it uses a mobile phone signal and GPS data to work out which pals are in the vicinity. Facebook assures those with privacy fears that the service is opt-in and that both parties need to switch the option on in order to share their location data. Amazon has launched the latest salvo in its streaming battle with Netflix. The online retailer has joined forces with US cable channel HBO in a deal that will make classic shows like The Sopranos and The Wire available to watch. The news comes in the same week that Netflix announced a potential increase to its subscription price for new members. Nokia as an independent entity is no more, as Microsoft has fine-tuned its 5.4 billion euro acquisition of the once mighty mobile company. Almost a month behind schedule, Microsoft says it's now completed the steps necessary to finalise the transaction after receiving long-awaited regulatory approval from China. Microsoft hopes the deal will strengthen its position in the mobile market. And the New York Police Department found itself committing a Twitter fail this week. The Big Apple's finest had asked users to tweet photos of themselves with police officers around the city. However, instead of enlightening encounters with their local cops, images of slightly less friendly situations quickly took over the hashtag. The experience didn't, however, deter the NYPD, who later described Twitter as an open forum for uncensored exchange. Now, how do you like to start your day? Nice cup of tea? Run in the park? Or if you're like me, being jumped on by a four-year-old who doesn't know the meaning of the word lion? Well, what if instead you strapped on an electronic headset and used it to train your brain to be more focused? Well, that's one of the elements of a research project by Goldsmith University here in London to study the impact of wearable technology in the office. Click was given exclusive access to follow the study and here's what happened. The offices of London media agency Mindshare have been infiltrated by researchers who want to monitor the employees' performance. This is one of the first academic studies to look at the effects of wearable technology on productivity, alertness and job satisfaction. Hence, for the last few weeks, 120 workers here have been attaching themselves to various devices. Emma, for example, has been recording her attention levels while playing a concentration game every morning. I found that actually I got really competitive with myself because you record your scores and you're trying to achieve because it has a panel of um, your brain activity. You kind of want to max that out but actually each day I was like, I get better scores, I want to get better scores and on my last day, really, I hit her. And I have to say, it's not as easy as it sounds. I tell you, if any stray thought enters your head, oh no, you're done. I don't know, that one, no. Meanwhile, Will has been wearing a belt which monitors his movements and corrects his posture. And then I'll be singing like this, and if, I don't know, I've got one of those emails, <laughs> you slouch, and then it, it's just a nice subtle vibrate, and it does, if because I've played around with it, if you slouch consistently, it really, it will keep vibrating, keep vibrating, keep vibrating, keep vibrating, until you sit up. Um, likewise, if you lean back in a chair. And Ashley is wearing a bracelet which measures light, temperature and sleep patterns, but which mysteriously gives him no feedback at all. Um, it measures sort of sleep pattern, um, your temperature throughout the day and sort of when you're most productive, basically. And how have you found wearing it? Um, it's a bit frustrating. I've gone to it quite a number of times looking for the time. It may stay silent, but it does record 100 readings every second. And in fact, it's used by Premier League football teams to measure player performance. Company management, however, are able to look at all the data from each employee. A consideration for those of us who like to take a screen break every now and then, although something that doesn't seem to overly bother Will. I'm not sure where that data will go through regards to the boss, but I think, I think something like that, because it's contributing to a healthy lifestyle, especially at work, um, I don't think I'd mind that because it shows workers are worried about you and they want to keep you fit and healthy and active in a job where you are at a desk. So, um, I'll but be you don't mind them that. saying, oi, you're not doing enough work. I've seen you. You're <laughs> off to the kitchen <laughs> I think three times an hour. Yeah, if they're counting each individual pace, then you know, it'll make it a, get a bit difficult. 
several weeks later, the enormous amount of data generated by the study, over 30 gigabytes per participant, has been crunched. It turns out the wearables have led to a 9% decrease in alertness, but a 3% increase in job satisfaction and an 8% increase in productivity. And surprisingly, the device that caused the biggest improvement in results was actually the one that gave no feedback or intervention at the time. We know of something called the Hawthorne effect in the workplace, which suggests that when you monitor or you change circumstances for employees, it has a positive impact on what they're doing. And uh, that's one explanation. And the other may just be that when people know that their productivity is being measured, then they're, they're more focused on it and, and therefore uh, score higher. But surely we're not going to agree to all wear these monitoring bands simply to make us work harder. Well, there could be advantages for you as well as that nosy boss of yours. There's phenomenal possibilities both for employees and for organizations. As an employee you could have something equivalent to almost like a biometric CV that you could use to show all of your uh, successful patterns and when you're most productive, when you're most alert, when you're most satisfied in the workplace and you could simply petition your employer to get a workplace scenario that meets those requirements because you can show them in the data uh, under what circumstances you perform at your highest levels. Of course, for all that to be useful, you do actually have to be good under pressure in the first place. Shh, I'm busy. And just in case you were wondering, yes, my brain still does hurt. After all that concentrating, it's just not my bag, really. Anyway, it's not just in the office where wearables are promising to improve our productivity. We sent Dan Simmons to a warehouse in Germany to check out the latest gear poised to make workers there just that bit more efficient. Alfred's starting his shift, which he hopes will help factory workers around the world in their daily tasks. His workplace is this mock-up factory in Munich. The new kit he's testing is Google Glass. Alfred is a picker. His job is to move products around the warehouse so they're in the right place to either be shipped or stored for later. And it's hoped the new glasses will make that easier. Now he doesn't have to look down at a clipboard or handheld device to cross-reference a code. With Glass he can see what he needs right in front of his eyes. Research has shown that glasses like these reduce errors by 40% and speed up workers by 10%. Great if you're the boss. Other staff can make use of it too. A service manager can survey the factory and the glasses will point out exactly which machines are faulty and can provide him with step-by-step -step instructions of how to fix the equipment. Well, I've been using the glasses for about 10 minutes or so, and it's really easy to see how they free up my hands. It increases efficiency. Um, it's like having a second brain, just simply telling me what to do. But it's also easy to see how workers using this system may feel that their role has essentially been reduced to being a robot following a sterile list of instructions. Because I don't have to think at all. But that could be the glass's biggest problem. Unions representing warehouse workers for the retail giant Amazon are already in dispute over working conditions and unrealistic efficiency expectations. And there's also a question of style. We had a workforce of like 20 people wearing these AR glasses for hours and actually didn't really feel comfortable. So really, you know, like colleagues were passing by laughing at them. So you can really see, I think people are not ready yet to use these glasses. Um, but I think this will change as soon as good designs come up in the future. Perhaps getting the glasses to stay working long enough is a far more pressing issue. Because augmented reality relies on complex algorithms and an always-on camera, the battery is sapped quickly. During these concept demonstrations, the glasses only manage to operate for 15 minutes. The company behind the concept is working on new advanced microchips that will use less power, so the glasses should be able to be used all day long. And then, of course, there's always the problem that we simply become far too reliant on technology. 
Hello? Hello? What, what am I supposed to do now? Hello? That's how Dan, always in control of every situation. And someone else who's always very much in control is Kate Russell. Here comes Webscape. I was only playing games. Despite the negative press they sometimes get, playing games can benefit all sorts of people, from preschool to pensioner. Everybody Plays is a website that celebrates the joy of casual gaming, its experts pitching recommendations and reviews to a much more general audience than the classic hardcore gamer, giving as much attention to all the different genres and independent developers rather than just blasting away at a handful of blockbuster titles. There is always a lot in the press about the effect of games on children. And it was a game called Elite that got me into technology way back in the mid-80s on the BBC Micro, if you remember those. So, in my personal experience, as long as you find the right game and don't play it to excess, gaming can have a very positive impact. As well as news and features to appeal to the more casual gamer, parents searching for an appropriate play will appreciate the parental review tab, featured on most pages, that hooks you directly into the opinion of actual parents, so you can be confident about your choice, even if you're not a gaming fan yourself. I was only playing games. Quip is a free mobile word processing app that's been on Apple platforms for around a year, with a dedicated Android build just released recently too. Like Google Drive, it offers full collaboration, but documents load much faster, and the app has Google account integration too, so making the switch should be relatively painless. This year it's expected that mobile connections will overtake fixed line as the dominant way to get online. With the world going collaboration crazy, Quip's fast loading, easy access and simple editing interface will no doubt prove very useful if you want to create documents on the go. Stacked notifications makes it easy to keep track of a lot of activity without the small mobile screen getting cluttered. The app also plays nicely with custom keyboards like SwiftKey and Swipe with support for 11 languages. Google has a lot more to offer than just documents and search, as the recent launch of its tips page proves only too well. Using the trendy card-style design, you can browse through the quick descriptions before clicking a link if you want to learn more. We will, we will the number of apps and tools from Google is pretty mind-blowing. Online documents, drive storage, calendar, mail, news, social, YouTube, browser, maps, earth, the list goes on and on. This tips page is an absolute treasure trove of shortcuts and hacks that might make you see Google services in a different light. There are 13 products covered in total and at the time of editing four full pages of tips are listed. You will need to sign up for and into a Google account to use them, but that's pretty much standard for so much of the internet these days. Whether you think the company's dominance is a good or bad thing is another matter entirely, but it's hard to deny these apps make life online simpler. Nice one, thank you Kate. And if you missed any of those links, they are all of course up at our website, bbc.co.uk slash click. If you'd like to get in touch with us about anything you've seen today, please do email us, click at bbc.co.uk, or you can get hold of us on Twitter, Facebook and Google Plus too. That's it for now though, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.